I'm here because optimizing Go code is fun and because I think this picture is just great. But the first question you should be asking yourselves is, is your program actually slow? By which we mean, do you think it could go fast? And there's a meme somewhere hidden in there. And lastly, is it worth optimizing? Because you're going to spend your own time doing that. It's, it's a trade-off, right? Let's enter a silly example. You've got a function that copies a list of strings. So you create a new, you want to you wanna make a copy. So you just um, declare a new, a, new, a new slice, append the elements, and then you return that new slice. That's pretty simple. You benchmark it, so you have some input slice, and then uh, you copy that list n times as part of your benchmark. And you get that this runs about at about uh, 5,000 nanoseconds per iteration, allocates about 10 times. Um, that seems normal. And if you run pprof, if you get pprof CPU profiling data, you see that it's the append line that takes the most time, which kind of makes sense because every time it has to, a few times it has to grow this slice, right? So what we can do is pre-allocate um, all the elements that we need for this slice, and then just assign each of the elements instead of using append. And that's great. It runs much faster, only allocates once, as you would expect. And uh, if we use a tool called BenchComp, which basically just compares the benchmark, no benchmark numbers before and after, you can see the green numbers. So that looks good. So we're done, right? Um, thanks for coming to my talk. See you later. But hang on, this is a very silly example. Usually you don't benchmark five lines of trivial Go code, right? Enter a JSON benchmark. I don't know if you're used to JSON in Go, but we all know it's a little bit complex and slow, so I think it's a good example. So here's a benchmark that what it does is it decodes a large data structure, which I think weighs like 10 megabytes into some structs. Uh, so you can see that it runs at about 200 megabytes per second. Uh, in one second, it runs 100 times, and it allocates a lot of garbage. So this benchmark is slow. But most importantly, it is not going to stay still. And that is a problem, because without touching the code at all, if you just rerun the same benchmark over and over, and then use bench comp to compare with the previous one, you're going to get fluctuations of up to 4 or 5%. And that's not, that's not any good, because the recent JSON decoder speedups have been as small as 1.3%. So if you've got slowdowns that large, how can you possibly measure improvement? So there's just too much noise. And the solution to this is math, or rather statistics. Now, before I get into this part of the talk, uh, you should know that I only took a couple of classes of statistics in school, and I, was, I slept through some of them. So I'm going to keep to practical terms. I won't talk about theory, because I don't think that's uh, particularly useful for uh, little examples like this one. So the idea is you want to get multiple samples. And with those samples, you can measure variance. Um, instead of using BenchComp, you're going to use a tool called BenchStat. And BenchStat is basically, basically the same thing, but a little bit smarter. So the first step is we need to collect a number of samples, in this case, eight. So we run the benchmark eight times, and then we just save that output into all.txt. And BenchStat can tell us this benchmark run in about 10, millisecond, 10 milliseconds plus minus 3%. That 3% is your variance. But we still need less noise, because we saw that some of the improvements have been as small as 1%. So 3% noise is still not good. The first question we should ask ourselves is, is, is our machine idle? Now, when I, usually when I work on Go code, I've got a couple of browsers, a couple of Slack tabs, editors, email, music, and so on. And that's usually OK. But my CPU usage usually um, sits at between 0 and 15%, even if I'm not doing anything at all. And this benchmark, this JSON benchmark, demands 100% of all of my CPUs, because it is a parallel benchmark. It uses all of your resources, resources if you let it. And here's a, a fun example. You can have emojis, animated, animated emojis on Slack. And there's this one of a dancing badger, which is clearly the best one of them. And uh, because Slack is a JavaScript app, uh, at least until re recently, every single one of these badgers would take 2% of my CPU, even if there's like 50 of them. So if there is actually 50 of them, there goes all of my CPU. So the advice here is you need, you need to close resource-hungry apps. And your uh, CPU usage should sit at a few percent uh, when idle, which is OK. We can work with that. So now if we rerun our benchmark eight times, 
the variance should be either zero or one percent. If it's not, maybe you still have something running in the background. But we've got another problem. Uh, the CPU burns. Um, if we run the benchmark about 20 times, on my laptop at least, after 10 or so, you're gonna see that it gets considerably slower. And the reason is that laptops throttle, and I've got some evidence for that. Here's the laptop here you can see on the stage, and that's my blue gopher. And you can see that the tiny air vents that you might not see at the bottom, they're smaller than the gopher feet themselves. So this laptop is doing a lot of work, but it cannot get rid of all that heat. So whenever I try to benchmark code, that's pretty much how it is, right? My lap on fire and my numbers be getting screwed up. So the solution to this is do, to not use turbo speeds. If your laptop uh, gets to turbo speeds for five, 10 seconds and then cannot hold them, just don't use them. But how do you do that? There's a tool for that, and I feel like that's the theme of this talk. It's called Perflock. You can see that Austin here is great at naming things because this is very useful. And what Perflock does is you run it as a daemon as, as root. I forgot the pseudo there. And then what you can say is, please run this program, uh, this command, at 70% of my total CPU power. And for example, in my case, 70% is the power that my laptop can sustain for a long period of time. It still gets hot, but it doesn't throttle. And 70% is still fast enough to give me realistic uh, numbers, right? A small caveat, this only works for Linux, but I'm sure if any of you have free time and use other systems, I'm sure Perflock could be ported to other systems. So if we run the benchmark eight times before and after without actually modifying any of the code, you should see something like this, which is that even if the average numbers jump a little bit, uh, because the variance is high enough, Perflock is able to tell you, oh, I don't, sorry, bench studies is able to tell you, I don't think anything changed here. Nothing meaningful happened. So that's the squiggly dash you can see there. Now, there's a couple of details that I uh, glanced over. One of them is what count should I use? And the other one is uh, what's a p-value? Uh, the p-value, I forgot to mention that, is the little p equal 0.247, you can see that there. And um, as much as all that I'm gonna say about these um, variant, uh, variables is that if you've got a lot of variants, you generally need more data samples. And I've got a, uh, a little visual aid for that here. Suppose that you've got three data points before and after, and they're plotted as little sitting gophers with the belly sticking out. Now, if you get, the, if you get this data and you're trying to figure out did anything actually improve, it's kind of hard to tell because maybe you just got lucky in that one there at the top. If that one was just a little bit lower, maybe you would think, oh, something got slower, right? It's kind of hard to tell, did I just get lucky once or twice? On the other hand, if you've got 10, visually as a human, you can see, oh, there's a cluster of gophers up here, and then another one a little bit further down there. Even if one of them was a little bit wrong, it's unlikely that seven of them are wrong at the same time and in the same direction. So this would give you a lower p-value. That's kind of the idea. But here's a gotcha. You shouldn't be searching for p-values, and this is called the multiple testing problem. The idea is that if you keep running the same benchmark uh, over and over again and comparing it without changing anything, this is statistics after all. So after some time, in this case five tries, I did get a significant result, but I didn't actually touch anything. I just got lucky. Or I might have gotten unlucky and it might have gotten slower. So if the data that you're getting looks bad in the sense that it's not giving you any meaningful result, don't get new data, because if you keep doing that, you're gonna get bad data, if that makes sense. Um, a small side note is bottlenecks. Uh, the tools that I've mentioned so far are mostly for CPU stuff, like pprof and perflock, but statistics, and in this case, benchstat, the, it works for all benchmarks, even if your benchmark is measuring network uh, performance or syscalls or anything else, it should still work, because it's just benchmark numbers. So to recap, you should use Benchstat to compare statistics, and then Perflock to avoid noise uh, when your laptop heats up and it's too slow. So now we get to the fun part before the demo, which is compiler tricks. Um, now, please don't worry about taking pictures or memorizing this, because the slides are gonna be uploaded later, so you can just try this out yourself. The first trick is to ask the compiler about decisions in mix. In this case, asking it when um, function calls could or not be inlined. So in this case, in the I.O. package, you can see 
that a, a function call to copy buffer wasn't inlined because it thought it would be a little bit too complex to inline. So it, the compiler estimated that it wouldn't be worth it. Another, uh, something else that this flag can tell you is whether or not an expression escapes the heap. And this usually means whether or not an expression allocates. So for example, um, here you're converting a string to a byte slice. So in this case, it would be copying that string into the heap to, so that it's modifiable by other, um, by other pieces of code, right? Because strings are not modifiable. Something else you can also ask it is about BCE, and that stands for bounce check elimination. So for example, when you index into a slice, uh, the runtime is gonna panic if you're out of bounds, right? So that's the, that's the compiler inserting those checks for you in the code. But it doesn't insert them everywhere because that would be too slow. Sometimes it can prove that these things are, are not necessary, that this check is not necessary. So in this case, it's telling you the cases where it, where it is inserting those checks. So if you've got a piece of code that's slow, maybe you can find one of those there and try to remove it. And that might speed up your code. But um, kind of the, what, the takeaway here is that the compiler is getting better. So for example, um, it used to be that the, the best way to, rep to empty a map was to entirely replace it with a new map. But what that does is just throws away all of that allocated memory and then allocates an entirely new map that's small. So if you've got large maps, that's very inefficient. Since Go 111, if you just range over the, the keys and delete them, the, the compiler pattern matches that and then just, just generates an efficient statement call that just does that efficiently. So if you do this, the, the thing at the bottom, it's fast, it reuses memory, and it's just so much better. Another example is that it used to be that the best way to count the number of runes in a string without using the standard library, just plain Go, was to iterate over that string and then just count n. And that was OK, but it was a little, um, it was a, a few too many lines of code. Now, if, what you can do is take the length of the rune slice of the string, and that used to allocate uh, back in the day, because converting a string to a rune slice, you know, it makes it modifiable, so it needs to copy and allocate. But since Go 111, it pattern matches that. It realizes, I don't actually need to allocate. I just need to count the number of runes. So it just does that. So it's as efficient as the first one, but it's simpler to write. So please give the compiler a chance. And if you think it could do better, please file a box so it can actually get better. If you want to look at the issue tracker, we use a label called performance. There's lots of stuff in there, but lots of stuff is also missing. So if you find issues that you think could be improved, please do file a bug. Otherwise, we wouldn't know about it. Here's a couple of readme files uh, for you to read if you want to learn more about how the compiler works. I only touched some bits, but there's lots of other interesting bits that you could um, investigate. And now we get onto the bench benchmarking demo. So I'm going to mostly shut up and start typing. Uh, things might work or not. We'll see. Uh, we'll find out together. So let's see. Cool. So what we're doing here is I've got a, a piece of code that generates lots of code. And it's kind of slow. So I want to I wanna optimize it. So get branch. Cool. So I'm in a, in a branch called demo start. That's very useful. Uh, so where I am is inside the compiler. And this piece of code called SSA slash gen, it generates code for the compiler. What it does, it's not important here. But what you need to know is that it, this is slow. If I do go run asterisk.go, can everybody read that? No. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. I, I don't think I can invert colors. Uh, one second. I'll come up with something. Uh, at the top, is it better? OK. So I'll just, hmm. OK. I'll just have less space at the top. That should be OK. OK, um, okay cool. Just ignore the window at the bottom. I'll just use the one at the top. Cool. So if we do go run. Uh, a little bit bigger, cool. If we do go run asterisk.go, what that does is it generates uh, this code. And in this case, the code is up to date, so um, not, nothing was changed. But um, it takes a while, right? So if I do bench command, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention, there's a tool called bench command. And what it does is it's kind of like getting the benchmarks from uh, go test, 
but it runs a command. So you can do bench command, the name, in this case, rule gen, go run asterisk.go. And what that does is it runs a command as if it was a, a Go benchmark. And that's useful uh, because you can actually measure um, performance of that command, in this case, my code generation tool. Cool, so we can do bench stat. Uh, oh, I didn't. Forgot to save that in the file. One second. So what we're going to do is run bench stat on those numbers, see what the current performance is, and then try to improve it and measure that improvement with bench stat as well. Cool. So if we do bench stat old, so we see that it takes about, whoop, oh, the window is too small. Yay. Uh, one second. So you can see that it takes about uh, 2.7 seconds per run. Um, you also get some other useful stats from bench, bench CMD, such as user time, system time, memory, peak memory usage, and so on. So the piece of code itself, I'll use another. I know that some of you might not see the code at the bottom, so I'll try to keep most of the interesting bits at the top, but I need most of the screen to actually edit code. So source, CMD, compile, internal, SSA, gen. Cool. So the actual piece of code that is slow, uh, what it does is it removes unused variables and imports from the generated code, because the tool that generates code, it just generates lots of code using variables and so on. But Go doesn't like unused variables, I'm, as, I'm, as I'm sure you're familiar with. So you need to remove those, otherwise the build is going to fail, and I can show that. Um, so what what the current piece of code does is a, a bit hacky. Um, it just removes all the unused variables um, walking the syntax tree. Now, it does that three times, and why is that? And I'll show you why. If we remove that and we just remove unused variables once, and then we rerun the code generation tool, and do git diff, uh, you'll see that now it's leaving behind some unused variables. And why is that? The reason is because you have pieces of code like foo equals something, and then bar equals foo dot field. So this is what's happening, right? right? So then the, the piece of code is deleting the second um, declaration, but not the first one. It's not, it's not finding deep unused variables, if that makes sense. But we don't want to run this program three times. We want to run this code three times over the generated code because that, that's slow. That's essentially what's making this code generator, to, generator slow. It's cool. So what we can do here is think a little bit. And we've got, I've got this piece, of code, code, uh, this piece of code called Walker. And it just walks the syntax tree and keeps track of which uh, variables are used or unused. And the thing is, in here, it marks when it finishes a block. Uh, scope, it, it finds which ones, which variables were declared in this scope and were never used, right? So this needs to cascade back to the uh, parent ones, if you will. So what we can do is keep track of um, which, um, which variable we are currently declaring. And I'm using, I declared a, a type called object, and that just, you can think of it as a, a, a variable. And then, um, when I find an assign statement, assign statement is, for example, foo bar. That's where, why it says define there. So when we find an assign statement, what we want to do is, here we want to say um, w.defining equals obj. We're defining this object at the moment. Uh, so what I want to do is keep track of, oh, um, the, the, for example, when I do bar equals foo.field, when I look at this, I want to make, sh make sure I know that, oh, this is used to define bar. So if then I remove bar, then I can make sure, I can see, oh, then foo has one less use than before. So maybe it also is unused now. I know this might be a little bit hard to follow, but it will be clear in a second, I promise. So what we're going to do as well is keep track of what the old one was. Defining, w defining equals old. Cool. The other thing we need to do is modify this object struct. 
So at the, at the moment, we only track the name of the variable being defined, the position where it was defined, and the number of users, um, the number of times it, that variable is being used. So when the number of users equals zero, then it is unused. And then whenever we find that in the scope, then the number of users for that object goes up. So that's pretty um, simple. But we need something else. Uh, we need to add something called used, which means, um, you know, variable, variables used to declare this one. Though, and I, that's a typo, uh, objects. Does that make sense? Because then, when we mark this object as unused, we're gonna decrement uh, the number of times those parent objects are being used. Cool. So, the last bit of, the last bit we have to do is, We want a loop here. So any unused equals true. And dun, 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 I'm going to unindent that. So what we're going to do now is ca actually cascade this effect. So we want to do uh, for used uh, object used, used dot num users minus minus. Because in this case, um, if we have, like I said before, if we have foo something and then bar equals foo dot field, if we, if we delete this line, then foo should have one less use because then that foo is gone, right? Cool, and that should go there. And we wanna use a loop with this Boolean to know when to stop, so we only try again if we decremented any um, num users fields. Now, uh, I've edited a lot of code. I'm gonna try to run it. We'll see what happens. Ah, obviously, this is live coding, so it's to be expected. Uh, three, three, five. Oh, range, there we go. Whoops. So if everything went well, git diff should say um, nothing was changed in the generated files because this should again remove all the deeply, all the nested parent unused variables. I don't know what the terminology here is. And this is taking a long time, so I, I don't like it. <laughs> Whoops, okay, let's debug. Li live debugging. Everything is fine. So, okay, any unused is never false. Okay, um, please cut this from the recording. Nobody knew, no, nobody saw it. Oh, something was modified. No laughing, please. Uh, hmm, it didn't work. Hmm, 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 hmm. This is how you know this is actual live coding, because I, I made a mistake and, hmm. None uses. Uh, Any use is true, so. Um, it's okay, a debug prints, th this might work. Oh, okay, so that's not actually being, oh, okay. So here's, uh, used is always empty. I forgot to actually add stuff to it, ah. Uh, so, oh yeah, uh, we're defining, right. So if, mm, so if w dot defining not equals nil. Wait, which direction is this? Uh, right, so, hmm. 
I knew how to do this an hour ago, but you know, being on stage, my thinking is greatly impaired. Um, so we've got, so object is where the definition is. Uh, so w defining dot users used equals append. I think, we'll see. Uh, Okay. Hmm. Okay, that's not finishing. Hmm. I'll try one last thing, and otherwise I've got a backup, not to worry. That looks fine. Why is it any unused? Is it looping there? Ah, yeah, it is. Hmm, interesting. Well, I am out of time and ideas, so please look away as I go back to my safeguard. Um, so git branch, I've got demo done. <laughs> uh, and we can actually diff and see where the bug is. So we could do, we could do arg broken, why? Uh, and then do demo broken, demo done, git diff, demo done, oh, git diff, demo broken, dot dot. Oh, oh, well, there we go. I forgot to only rerun the thing if the num new number of, un of users is zero. Otherwise, it just keeps doing that forever. Tiny bug. You're going to forgive me, right? So now, if we run go run asterisk.go, it should finish, and it should give us an empty diff. All good. So what we can do is, um, rule gen uh, go run asterisk.go t new. And if that finishes correctly, we should get a small improvement. Yeah, there we go. So it's about 5% faster. And you can see I actually didn't run a perflock in this case. So you can see that the variance is up to like 2 3%. I could have used perflock. I forgot. Uh, but I could have done it. And I would have gotten slightly better numbers. But these are still good. Cool. So I think that's pretty much it for the demo. Um, as you can see, um, even if you don't have a benchmark, you can still optimize and profile and compare the numbers for your command. So I feel like this is approachable and usable by pretty much everyday gophers, even if you don't have performance-critical code. So thanks for listening.